Yeah, so I never liked opera growing up. Um, I, I always liked um, chamber music or solo music, uh, even more than orchestral music. But as I started writing my own music, um, I kept getting attracted to words and especially to, we talked before, I think, about these imaginary worlds that non word music creates you know you're you're somehow following a story it's somehow important humanly if it's good music but i fill in the details myself and i started realizing that one of the great things about opera is that if you make the right kind of story you can still have this kind of um abstract uh, subliminal quality of music to uh to, to to take you on a journey but you can root it just enough in a particular situation, a particular, um, you know, um, kind of real situation that a person might have or a particular uh, context in the real world. If it's done in the wrong way, it kind of, um, I think, puts a straitjacket on music and a lot of the, um, a lot of the power music has to really take us somewhere unexpected can go away. But if you do it in the right way, uh, music's, the music's subliminal power stays and it, uh, it, it connects to your own life uh, and to real situations more closely. So I, I've done a lot of operas. I've probably done more different kinds of operas than anybody because I've, I've been trying to explore this form and see how to get the most out of it. The brain opera where you, the public helps to create it. Um, I did science fiction opera for the Pompidou Center in Paris, um, this, this magic opera with Penn and Teller. The one I'm working on now is called Death and the Powers, and uh, it has an original story uh, and libretto by Robert Pinsky, the, the great poet. And um, actually, my, one of my original images for this opera was, I'm so tired. In, in some ways, technology's wonderful. I, I, I love working with technology because it allows me to follow my imagination and to invent new things. But a lot of the feeling of technology, I, you know, what things sound like when they come through loudspeakers, what it looks like when you go to a rock concert and you see um, a giant screen with Bono's nose and then, you know, on stage, u is about this big. And so I think in many ways, the texture of technology actually diminishes human beings. It doesn't augment them. So I started thinking, well, how could we take this kind of hyper-instrument idea of measuring the way humans perform, the way they behave, the way they sing, the way they move, making that larger and more and, and um, you know, growing it through the performance. But so the final result wouldn't be coming out of loudspeakers and wouldn't be just video screens, but could actually be physical things. Could we make it so that if I move my hand here, there's some strings that start vibrating or there's wind that blows through some objects or or um, there are percussive you know multiple percussive objects that either make a sound like that or maybe much more delicate sounds so and and visually as well you know could we do something where flying objects and 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 morphing forms um, real physical ones com combined with the music uh, help to tell a story even if there are no words so I contacted uh, Robert Pinsky, this poet, to say, um, you, know, you want to work on a crazy project like that? Can we make a stage tell the story? And before we had a story, I was thinking about that. And then we made up a story, which uh, turned out to literally be about, it's about a guy who's in his late 60s, um, rich, powerful, successful, slightly creepy, kind of like um, Bill Gates meets Howard, uh, sorry, Bill. Bill Gates meets Howard Hughes meets Walt Disney, somebody like that. Um, and he's obsessed not so much with staying alive forever. In fact, he actually wants to leave the world and he imagines a, a kind of better, higher level of existence. So he wants to go, but he wants everything about himself, his memories, the texture of his life, his ability to still be in touch with the people he loves, his ability to manipulate you know, his business partners or whatever. He, all, he wants that to stay. So he uses his money and his smarts and his power to invent this thing called the system, which basically allows him himself, he basically can download himself into his environment. So in the first scene, 
he's just finishing this system and his wife and his daughter and his, his assistants are saying, yep, it's almost ready, but you know, are you still gonna be, is it gonna be you? Where are you gonna go? Don't leave, what is this? And he turns on the system at the end of the first scene, says, see you later, and transmigrates, he, he goes somewhere. And little by little, the stage comes alive. So the stage is like a big robot. And his whole room, which is made up of bookcases and furniture and objects and a gigantic chandelier, which looks like a chandelier, these all turn into him and they start to move and they start to vibrate and they start to make sound. And they don't literally look like him and they don't literally necessarily sound like him, although he does talk and sing through them in a modified form. This becomes the future of his existence. And everybody who's left has to decide, is this really him? Is that you, Dad? Is that you, Simon? Uh, they have to decide if um, they like this. I mean, he's left himself, he's left his legacy. This is what he wants to leave in the world. Do they, do they want this stuff? Do they, they want to live with this Simon left behind? And then they have to decide if this existence, he, he actually wants them all to follow him. So they have to decide whether what we know of his human existence is good enough. Should we stay here? Or is this really a promise of something better? Um, and that's, that's where the tension of the opera comes. So it's a very unusual one. We have this um, set that makes music and comes alive and moves and interacts with characters. It's quite large. We're building it all from scratch at the MIT Media Lab. We have live, uh, live performers on stage as well. We have a chorus of robots. They're, they're 12 robots, seven feet tall. They actually are uh, three and a half feet that extend to seven feet. They comment on the action. They're actually slightly futuristic. They're also being designed by this research assistant. They're kind of a bridge between now and the future. Um, and they're a little bit mechanical. They glide around. They don't really understand what's going on because they're, you know, they're robots. So death and, uh, you know, Simon somewhere else, uh, love. Why, what is this stuff? Why would you care about this? And then uh, my favorite characters, I think, are the furniture. Um, because I wanted very unexpected parts of the set to not exactly be human, but be able to reach out to humans. So the chairs and the tables and the sofa all have legs that walk around and they glide around. And there's kind of, they're not as well developed as, the, as what we call the opera bots, the elegant seven foot ones. They're kind of strange and um, they're lurching and they're trying to be as elegant as humans. They're trying to imitate their voices so they learn how to talk. And um, it's just a, a, a very strange world and it's, it's, it's a tug of war between um, the limit between a human being and what a very sophisticated technology can represent about yourself. Um, so it's a reflection about mortality and what you can leave behind and what you can pass on to others. And um, I think it's a, a reflection about being human. Strangely, some of the most human characters, it's one of my themes generally, I think some of the technology, especially these furniture robots, are more emotional and more, um, uh, more real, more human, certainly than you'd ever expect technology to be, but then some of the humans.